Christmas has come and gone, and also the new year. And if we're honest, we would probably have to admit that most of us, if not all of us, have been feeling rather exhausted. We do it every year. The mad rush to buy the presents before the shops close on Christmas Eve, remembering to order the turkey in time, and if we're really organised, to make Christmas cake well in advance. And then there's the hard slog, or so it perhaps seems to me, of writing all those endless Christmas cards and then finding space to put up all those cards we receive in return. The late night partying, fireworks to welcome in the new year, an endless orgy of eating and drinking, and so the frenzy goes on until we reach today, as we celebrate the great feast of Epiphany. And for a moment, we pause. Tomorrow, the world goes back to work, if they haven't already done so. Schools reopen. It's back to the daily routine. But today, as we celebrate Epiphany, we pause for a moment. I do love Epiphany. It's a very ancient feast, and its celebration is even older in the life of the church than Christmas. As the Eastern Church, where Christ Christianity began, and still to this day, they celebrate the advent of Christ, the revelation of Christ as God incarnate on this day. Epiphany. If the meaning of Christmas, and I mean the deep down meaning, not the frenzy and rush of materialism, but rather God's gift to us as the son of Jesus Christ, born in a manger at Bethlehem, is the meaning of Christmas, is all about what God gives us, then Epiphany is about what we give God. It's about our response to the gift of Jesus. Matthew is actually the only one of the four Gospels who gives us this wonderful, colourful story of the wise men from the East bearing gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh to present to the baby Jesus. These wise men are indeed exotic and mysterious figures. Traditionally, magi means wise men, but maybe astrologers, most probably not kings, and probably from modern-day Iran. And in any nativity play you go to, there will be three of them. But it doesn't actually say there were three in the text, simply that they bore three gifts. And if we remember anything from this story, it is likely to be that the magi, magi gave those three gifts, gold, frankincense and myrrh. So let's look at these three gifts for a moment, for they rich in layers of meaning. The well-known Epiphany hymn that we've just sung speaks of gold of obedience, suggesting the obedience we owe to Christ as our true king. The wise men themselves may have been kings ruling a kingdom, we don't know. But however powerful they may have been in their sumptuous gifts, they acknowledged that Jesus deserved their allegiance, just as a subject owes allegiance to a king. And on a more literal level, the gold could simply indicate wealth. They were giving up their wealth, their livelihood, to Jesus in a symbolic gesture. <clears throat> it's sometimes said that there are three main ways we can give to God, all beginning with T, to make it easy to remember. Time, talents, treasure. Perhaps a somewhat simplistic way at looking how, at how we should give to God. Certainly the wise men who gave Jesus gold were literally giving up some of their treasure. But I'm sure there are in fact countless ways in which we can give to God on all kinds of levels and meanings. Money, material wealth is just one way. At Epiphany, perhaps it's, a good, it's good to ponder how much of our material wealth, money, property, possessions, we do use for God. And do we give, we give willingly to God? And how much do we give them to God by giving them to others to share? The wise men's gift gets more curious as they go on. Frankincense. Since at least Jewish Old Testament times, incense has been a powerful symbol of worship, of prayer. As it says in Psalm 141, 
O Lord, I call to you. Come quickly to me. Hear my voice when I call to you. May my prayer be set before you like incense. May the lifting up of, our, of my hands be like the evening sacrifice. And elsewhere in the Bible, in the book of Revelation, for instance, the wafting of incense is likened to prayers of the saints rising to God. Incense with its sweet smell and air of mystery is an, evo an evocation of our worship, our devotion. But as the Epiphany hymn also suggests, it is also a costly devotion. Following Christ is costly. And so then we come to the most mysterious of the wise men's three gifts, myrrh. And in ancient times, myrrh was a resin used for embalming the dead. The third gives, gift gives a bitter sweet tone to this enchanting story of the wise men who follow the star. Jesus is not long born, and one of the first presents he received is a gift to be used at his burial. We probably wouldn't exactly welcome the present or a gift of the coffin at Christmas. But there is a stark reality to this third gift. The crib points to the cross. The joy of Jesus' birth points to the shadow of his death on the cross. And of course, that death was for us all. All are included in the embrace, embrace of Christ's love, every person, every human. And this story of the wise men is the first story in the Gospels to indicate this truth. Those wise men travelled a long, long way. The journey was a long and hard one. The 20th century poet T.S. Eliot captures this hauntingly in the opening lines of his poem entitled Journey of the Magi. A cold coming we had of it, just the worst time of year. For a journey and such a long journey, the ways deep and the weather sharp, the very dead of winter. The wise men came from a long and far away land, an unspecified place in the east, far away from Jewish traditions of God's chosen people. And yet, and this is the marvelous truth of this story, and yet they recognize Jesus. And their devotion tells us in the story from the truth uh, that St. Paul so often likes to tell us in his letters, that Christ's death and resurrection has opened up a way to God, not just for the Jews, but also for the Gentiles, not just for the faithful believers, but for the wayward and the far off. The word epiphany literally means showing or revealing. And in this story, Jesus is shown or revealed to the Gentiles, to people who have never heard of him. In our own increasingly secular society today, here in England and across the world, there are people around us who have never really heard of Jesus and the loving ways of God. This feast of Epiphany gives those of us who are privileged to know and love God a multifaceted challenge. Do we give sufficiently of ourselves to God? Is our giving of ourselves in response to our, to our lavish God costly? And are we open to those around us, perhaps even those who live in our street, who still have quite a long way to travel in their search for love and truth? Are we open enough to help them as they too travel on their journey? when the ways are deep and the weather sharp. So what has been your epiphany this year? What gift will you give back? What has God revealed you to you as your New Year's resolution? Not the, I must cut down on food, drinking, cigarettes, those kind of resolutions, healthy though they may be, but the God-given kind, the I'm going to make a difference this year kind of resolution. And they're looking to see where God is at work and joining in. As a bit of a guide, which might be helpful and hopefully will start some discussion, I'm going to ask Ian to post online a fi five Ps to get us all talking and thinking. 
they'll have more detail online. But now, just for just now, the five Ps are planet, poverty, peace, politics, and people. Please do read them in full as we enter the delights and privilege of this epiphany season. And let us reflect and ponder ever more deeply on the mystery of the incarnation of God, born as one of us. And let us endeavour to be open to God's gifts revealed to us in Jesus and to share those gifts with our fellow travellers on the way. Amen. <laughs>